Good evening, hushlings, and welcome. I present your preceptors to the underbelly of the void, the whispers of conjecture, and the known of the unknown. Thus begins the conclave of the Hush Hush Society. Greetings, hushlings. I'm Declassified Dave. And I'm Mystery Mike. And as always, we're joined by our companion, Slick Frank Sanders. Yo, yo, what's up, guys? Greetings. Gang, gang, son. Bleh. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Pretty good. Hyped to get into all this. I'm looking forward to getting back into the meat and potatoes of the show. Of the actual conspiracy, The cream of the crop. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome back to the Hush Hush Society Conspiracy Hour. The last two debriefings, we went over the Vatican. We talked about a multitude of things that could be going on in the Vatican, mainly the Vatican archives. We talked about them possibly housing the devil, having a device known as the chronovisor, which is almost like a time viewer machine. It's VR porn. VR priest porn. Yep. We talked about the priest porn. <laughs> We talked about the vast collection of erotica they have, the existence of Jesus Christ himself. That was an interesting one. The Three Secrets of Fatima was definitely probably the weirdest of that whole debriefing set. Yeah, prophecies are always a little weird because sometimes I feel like you can find truth in any prophecy that's said or interpretation of a prophecy, much like Nostradamus and them saying, oh, he's, he's been right so many different times. Maybe we should do a show on Nostradamus. We should. That's not a bad we idea. Should. Yeah. We also talked about my favorite parts was like the Galileo trials and the Knights Templar. Those were some interesting connections, like the Knights Templar being something that's continuing today as the Illuminati. There was a lot of history to those episodes too, like a lot of background information regarding the history of the of the Vatican. So that's always interesting stuff to me since I enjoy the history side of things. I do as well. That was that was a fun episode. But yeah. this week on debriefing thirteen, we are zipping through the desert to Area fifty one and S four, the most secretive known military installation. In, I guess, the world, right? Or at least the United States. I'd say so, yeah. But before we probe into all this information, let's remind you to check out all of our social medias. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We also have a YouTube where we post all the audio for every episode that you listen to. You can hear our sweet, sensual voices with a, uh, a very stylish still to every episode. <laughs> you can also find us on TikTok where we are trolling and doing viral dances that stick our booties way out. Way out. <laughs> Make sure to also go on YouTube and check out the Declassified Discussions with Declassified Dave. He does interviews with a bunch of people talking about their paranormal experiences, UFOs, aliens, lights in the sky, and all their sexual fantasies. <laughs> <laughs> in an interview format. Also releasing later this week, we will have the first episode of the Cryptid Chronicles. We will be talking the Jersey Devil with our friend Jeremy from the Infinite Rabbit Hole podcast. That was a super fun episode to record. Yeah, yeah that was a lot of fun. One. Everybody's going to enjoy that one. Area 51 is the common name of a highly classified United States Air Force facility located within the Nevada Test and Training Range. A remote detachment of Edwards Air Force Base... The facility is officially called Homey Airport, or Groom Lake, named after the salt flat situated next to its airfield. The U.S. Air Force says that it is an open training range and is most likely used for development and testing of experimental aircraft and weapons. The facility has been also referred to as Dreamland and Paradise Ranch, and it is located in the southern portion of Nevada, in the western United States, it's 83 miles north-northwest of Las Vegas. Not to be mixed up with the Bunny Ranch, which is a famous brothel also in Nevada. The United States Air Force acquired the site in 1955, mainly for flight testing the Lockheed U-2 aircraft. The origin name Area 51 is unclear. Believed to be from an Atomic Energy Commission numbering grid, although Area 51 is not part of this grid, it is just adjacent to Area 15. That's interesting. We'll just switch the numbers around and call it that. You think anybody would figure that out? Yeah, just a little flip-flop. 
the easiest thing. It's like escape rooms. It's always the easiest thing right in front of you. They just got real lazy with the with the secret <laughs> name of it. The surrounding area is a popular tourist destination, including the small town of Rachel on the quote-unquote extraterrestrial highway. The original rectangular base of 6 by 10 miles is now part of the so-called quote-unquote groom box, a rectangular area measuring 23 by 25 miles. That's a large piece of land right there. Hell yeah, it is. Does anybody know what that is, square mile-wise? 575 square miles. Okay. Enough to hide a lot of shit. Mm-hmm. But it's also a part of a larger 680 square mile section of the Nellis Air Force Gunnery and Bombing Range, which was designated the Nevada Proving Grounds on December 18th in 1950 and included the Yucca and Frenchman Flats, the Paiute and Rainier Mesas. And we all know what the Proving Grounds were. I'm pretty sure that's where they tested the atomic bomb a mm-hmm. lot of times. Mm-hmm. Jimmy, take your men and go stand over by that. <laughs> the presidential order also established Groom Lake Field, Tonopah Test Range, Area 52. They definitely had a number set. Area 51 was first. Why not call it 52? Just getting lazy again. Goddamn government. The known primary use of this airport is to shuttle government employees to the weapons test range from McCarran International Airport in Las Vegas. It's crazy. Have you ever been? I mean, you've been to, you've, Mike, you've been to Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been outside, just driven for a couple hours outside? Yeah. Yeah. It's It's just like nothing, right? Nothing, dude. It's nothing. It's hours and hours and miles and miles of nothing my favorite part about driving to las vegas is going through prim in good springs it's just like a fallout boner so mccarran international airport if you haven't been to mccarran international airport they have a giant bunny statue inside of it which is kind of fun but (laughs) (laughs) Uh, so let's talk about homie airport obviously homie airport is the name for area 51's airstrip also known as kxta i guess if you're gonna look at it on uh google earth google earth or flight flight maps or or anything like that would that even show up on flight maps i'm sure it would if it's if it's an actual four letter name then that's the name of that airport i mean homie airport i'm sure shows up because i think that's what actually shows up but the thing that doesn't show up you can't buy a ticket to janet airlines Janet Airlines is the unofficial name given to a highly classified fleet of passenger aircraft operated by the United States Department of the Air Force as an employee shuttle to transport military and contractor employees. Due to the airline's secretive nature, little is known about the organization. The purpose is, like Mike said, to pick up employees at their home airport, which is McCarran in Las Vegas, and take them to their place of work which is Groom Lake or dun-dun-dun, Area 51. The airline mainly serves Nevada National Security Site, most notably Area 51 and Tonopah Test Range, from a private terminal at Las Vegas McCarran International Airport. The airline's aircraft are generally unmarked, but do have a red paint strip along the windows of the aircraft, which gives some sort of hint at Janet being the operator of the aircraft. As of mid-2015, the Janet fleet consists of six Boeing 737-600s, painted white with a prominent red cheat line. The fleet is registered to the Department of the Air Force. The fleet's, quote, Janet sign is said to stand for just another non-existent terminal or joint air network for employees' transportation or a combination of two acronyms, JAN, Joint Army Navy, and E.T., extraterrestrial. I think, (laughs) honestly, I think the third one would be the most plausible. It's definitely the most fitting. Yeah. Are these all just, like, speculated Yeah, I I would would probably say they're probably speculated by the tinfoil hat community. I doubt that the Air Force is coming out and saying, yeah, this is is for extraterrestrial uh, employee transport. (laughs) But uh, you know what? Well, I could see them coming out and saying joint air yes, network that, for employee transportation, but then other people trying to twist it, you know? If they're flip-flopping Area 15 to Area 51, then I would say it's the third one. But if you want to talk about what, <laughs> yeah, but if you want to talk about like what's probably normalized in the way that the verbiage is, it's probably joint air network for employee transportation. So really what it boils down to is their creative ability to come up with acronyms. 
Just lazy, bro. <laughs> lazy. Yet again, letting us down. Which brings us to talking about another airstrip, which is a lesser known one. We talk about the Cheshire airstrip. So there's a story about seeing this airstrip. And the source is a commercial pilot with a strong interest in Area 51. While he was socializing with other pilots, the topic of Area 51 came up. And he discovered that several of his acquaintances had previously worked for EG&G and Key Air. And they had flown the, quote, commuter runs between Las Vegas, Groom Lake, and the Tanapa test range facilities. This is straight up speculation. This is a story that I was reading. This is a partial quote. One of the pilots that we were talking about had said, occasionally they flew to somewhere else in the Nellis complex. This quote somewhere else is what made the story such an interest to pilots and it was far from routine flying. Before these flights left Las Vegas, the pilots had to get clearance from NORAD to ensure that there weren't any foreign spy satellites overhead. That's actually wild. Like before you take off, you have to make sure that there's clearance in not just airspace, but space. Russian spy satellites. That would add some validity to it, I would imagine, when you're talking about security. I wonder how long that's been like a procedural thing. Mm. Has that been in place since the 50s? Has that been just kind of a running order since its inception? I wonder about probably, that. Probably, probably, yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good question. I'd assume since like the 50s, since people were starting to go to space. As long as satellites have been around, but we weren't the first ones to put satellite in space, so. No, no. And it continues, as they approached their destination, they contacted the ground and set up their landing pattern. What made it difficult from the pilot's viewpoint was that there wasn't a runway in sight and only miles of sagebrush and covered desert. If if you know what Southern Nevada or any of Nevada looks like, you'll know what I'm talking about. Then as they continued their approach, a runway suddenly appeared in the midst of a sea of nothingness. End quote. That's fucking crazy. That is pretty insane. If you if you think about it, it's like flying blind. And then all of a sudden, this airstrip just appears in front of you. Poof. I don't see that being impossible. No, no, no of you know, course like not. From a, from a technical standpoint, like some sort of optical illusion until you got to a certain height from the ground, you wouldn't be able to see it. Yeah, certain angles and whatnot. Yeah, we talk yeah, about yeah. a little bit of it in the Philadelphia Experiment, our first episode. They're yeah. talking about miraging things or go listen to it. Hmm. Imagine being that day one pilot <laughs> yeah <laughs> and and you're flying with with this guy that's probably done the run before and he turns to you and he says hey uh we're going just keep flying this way yeah and and don't worry if it looks like you're gonna fly into a mountain because you're not that's got to be nerve-wracking yeah even if you are a person who's flown it before you're probably waiting for that one day where you turn the corner and you think hey here come the lights and then you don't see them and you freak out minorly <laughs> <laughs> minorly i wonder if that's happened before you think people have like crashed over this fucking no there's no way they didn't runway. brief them beforehand oh i'm sure i'm sure but it's just like anything else i'm sure it's it would be funny still- Something. It would it would be more funny in our brains, the three of us, if you didn't tell the rookie <laughs> on the first flight. <laughs> Hell yeah. How to lose your job. Can you imagine easy. if that's how the Titanic yeah. happened? His, like, commanding officer flips out on him. <laughs> <laughs> Titanic yeah, happened. can you imagine if that's how the Titanic happened? They didn't tell him about the ice. They all knew about it, and it was just an insurance scheme. We'll get there. We'll get into that when we get into <laughs> we'll the Titanic. We'll get there. The source of this story is a commercial pilot who flies for a regional airline. Mind you, this is a second-hand story, but the reliability of the initial story is unknown. The location given for this airstrip was Dead Horse Flat in the center of Area 19. Now that would be probably the grid that we were talking about beforehand. So it's a part of the Atomic Energy Commission's numbering grid. Area 19 must be not too far away from Area 15, which is what they called Area 51. And are uh, all of these areas, these are all part of this massive 500 plus square mile chunk of land? I would assume so. Is an area 51 just the 500 square mile? Well, that's part of the Nellis Proving Grounds, which is, what, 680 something square miles. So I think it's, it's inside a complex, which is inside another complex. So I think it's just how far in the grid you actually are. It's multiple military complexes put into one. When you're talking about the Nellis Proving Grounds, it's talking about the whole range, where that's where they set off the atomic bombs, but Area 51 lies within that. That's a a staggering 
amount of land, if you really think about it. Yeah. There's there's a lot of land out there, man. Yeah, of course, but it's still staggering to think about that. Like, fi- you think 500 miles is not a lot, or maybe you think it is a lot, but in terms of square miles... 23 miles by 25 miles is still that's that's massive yeah that take, takes you it'll take you take yeah. you a little while doing i mean if you're driving in nevada the speed limits are like fucking 80 so you know it won't take you that long but it's still <laughs> a huge chunk of real estate to have and that's just that's probably not the largest that the united states has i'm sure they have bigger in texas and oh, california know. and unknown places maybe in their underground tunnels mm. Mm. in the sides of mountains and shit mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. now that we've given a little background on area 51 and the surrounding lands let's get into the conspiracies regarding the complex the intense secrecy surrounding the base has made it a frequent subject among conspiracy theorists and the central component of ufo folklore which is why the entire surrounding area is all one big tourist trap. <laughs> yes. The storage, examination, and reverse engineering of crashed alien spacecraft, including material supposedly recovered at Roswell, the study of, the, of their occupants, and the manufacture of aircraft based on alien technology. There's also meetings or joint undertakings with extraterrestrials. Supposedly, the development of exotic energy weapons for the Strategic Defense Initiative, or STI, and other weapons programs are going on there as well. The development of DEWs, or direct energy weapons, which control the weather. And development of time travel and teleportation technology. Lastly, we have the supposed development of exotic propulsion systems related to the Aurora program and activities related to a shadowy one world government or the Majestic 12 organization. MJ-12 in the house. (laughs) Shout out MJ-12. The base has never been declared a secret base, but all research and occurrences in Area 51 are top secret or sensitive compartmented information. The CIA publicly acknowledges the existence of the base for the first time on June 25th, 2013. What a great day that was. Following a Freedom (laughs) of Information Act request filed in 2005, and they declassified documents containing the history and purpose of Area 51. It's like we were talking about with the Vatican when they release like certain Vatican papers. When the CIA releases documents for public viewing and declassifies them, that's not the entire truth. As much as they want you to believe that that's the entire truth, it's not. You don't you don't get all the documents. They have definitely looked over these things and said, "No, nope, they're not ready for this. They're not ready for this. We'll file that back under secrecy." It, You're only given the pieces of information that they want you to know. I can't recall whether it was during the research for MJ-12 or for JFK, but I recall coming across different documents that you could find on government websites, maybe let out by the CIA. And on these documents, there was still shit like blacked out. Oh, we released the documents, but you can't see this line or this line Mm -hmm. or that line or that line, you know? I'm always weary of that, especially when the CIA is involved with that, because as we've talked about throughout a couple of our debriefings, the CIA never really followed the rules anyways. So something like the Freedom of Information Act, which anybody can file, apparently, you really think that the CIA is going to turn around and say, hmm, yeah, here, here you go. Here's everything yeah, that here's... we've been keeping secret for you for 60 years. Here's everything. That's not happening. As we mentioned, the Majestic 12, if you didn't join us for debriefing 007, which was about Majestic 12, brief background, MJ-12 is an organization, and it's claimed to be the codename of Alleged Secret Committee of Scientists, Military Leaders, and Government Officials, formed in 1947 by an executive order by U.S. President Harry S. Truman to facilitate the recovery and investigation of alien spacecraft post the Roswell incident. Yeah, so so with MJ-12, I feel like they would have a massive playing role in Area 51 and the, the recovery and reverse engineering of any spacecraft or anything like that, especially in like the earlier days of the alien hype up during the Roswell crash. I'm pretty sure they still have majestic clearance. 
You think so? I'm pretty sure Majestic is still, as we've discussed before, there is a documentary called Above Majestic about the secret space program, which might mm-hmm. not have actually taken place at Area 51, but might have started there. I mean, there's other Air Force bases in the United States, like in Ohio, that have supposedly had alien spacecraft in them. There's other ones, but this is the top dog. I keep coming back to the thought that I had regarding our episode on MJ-12 and the Roswell incident is if there's no truth to any of these things, if there was no recovery of a UFO, there was no recovery of alien beings, or Area 51 is not housing spaceships and reverse engineering propulsion systems and, and stuff of that sort, where do these stories come from? Not so much nowadays because Nowadays, the world is filled with a lot of crackpots, and it's built on previous information and previous conspiracies and previous pop culture. But back in the in the 40s and the 50s, people out in Nevada, I doubt, are just attributing everything to aliens and saying, well, there's weird things going on at Area 51, so it has to be extraterrestrial involved, or they have to be doing something involving UFOs. And, and advanced technologies. It could be entirely wrong. That could be just an assumption of people. Yeah, but why would they come to that assumption if there was, like, no prior rumors or knowledge? I guess that brings us to a little-known location about Area 51, a part of Area 51, which is S4 and Papoose Lake. Papoose Lake is a dry, crusty lake bed <laughs> located in Lincoln County, Nevada, and it lies within the plot of land referred to as the Groom Lake Facility, a.k.a. Area 51, and it is a restricted area. The lake is located a few miles southwest of the Groom Lake Facility, nestled adjacent to the Papoose Mountain Range. Nice and nestled. Tucked away. The fish you pull from that lake, they probably look like those three-eyed fish from The Simpsons. (laughs) Hell yeah. It's a dried-up lake bed, man. Oh yeah, there's no water. (laughs) Yeah. They ain't pulling no fish. I don't know. With all that radiation, maybe they've evolved. <laughs> yeah, they're maybe they're floating captain. fish. They're just walking around. Yeah. That brings us to, to one of the biggest claims that this area is actually doing shady shit. It might not be malicious. Some of it might be. But there's one guy, and I'm sure some of you have heard of him. His name is Robert Lazar, or Bob Lazar. Apparently, they, they claim him to be an American conspiracy theorist. I think this guy is actually telling the truth because why would you fuck up your whole life giving away all this information but he claims to be hired in the late 1980s to reverse engineer extraterrestrial technology that he described was at a secret site called s4 which is an installation just south of area 51 he claimed to have gotten this job interview through a company i think it was contracted as we said before eg and g which kind of comes full circle a little bit why would this guy bring up a company like that that he might have interviewed for for a job yeah just out of nowhere yeah i've never heard of eg and g until i've heard of Bob Lazar. Listen, even before we get into Bob Lazar's backstory and what his claims were, this man is now rectified in everything that he said. I'm sorry. We've said it before. As a conspiracy theorist or as a a whistleblower, you're not gaining anything in life. You're no. really getting all the negative effects of not only people in your normal everyday life, but you're also getting the negative effects in threats and phone calls and all that other shit from just shady people that are like, keep your fucking mouth shut. You're not going to tell anybody about this, you know, for him to go pretty much his entire life saying the things that he's that he said and kept to his story. And now with the Air Force revealing that we have UFOs and stuff like that, he's got to be feeling pretty good. It's got to be a little bit of vindication. That's, that's you know, what I'm saying. There. You know? Even on the minor shit, I recall it was an earlier interview of his. He had described some sort of biometric security system that you had to like scan your hand on yep. to actually get into the facility. And not only did it get like your handprint, but it was like the bones inside. It measured the bones, which is unique to everybody. Yeah, and people called him fucking crazy for it, and then like 10 yeah. years later, they disclosed that they had this this technology. Mm. 
I believe it was Jeremy Kenyon Lockyer Corbel. Yeah, the guy that did the uh, the documentary on him. Yeah. Yes. Bob yes. Lazar, Area that, 51 a... in Flying Saucers. And he was also on the Rogan podcast, which if you guys listen to that, those are really good episodes. I think he's had them on more than once. Yeah. Not not Bob Lazar, but he's had Bob Lazar on once. But I think he's had Jeremy Corbel and George Knapp, who was a reporter that the reporter that actually got this story out in Nevada. He was a Las Vegas reporter, mm. and the guy's been backing for him for like since the eighties. Yeah, so yeah, they got definitely some weight the weight to his claims. It's a it's a decent documentary. Jeremy Corbel is kind of part of it. In a way, he kind of ruins the documentary. But watch it if you've never seen it. It's very artistic. Yeah, watch it if you've never seen it. Just to see Bob Lazar and hear his story and mm-hmm. kind of how it has affected his life in either a negative or positive way. Mostly negative. And it's on Netflix or Tubi for free if you want. It's a good one. I watched it actually recently just to brush up on it, just to see. And every time I listen to it, man, or every time I watch it, it just puts more weight into like what I actually believe is going on. And like you said before, why would somebody just ruin their life over, I guess, coming off as crazy? Because we talk about UFO encounters on the declassified discussions, but do people think that we're nuts because of that? But this guy is claiming the same thing. He's claiming a lot more, but essentially the existence of the same thing. Lazar has claimed that he reverse engineered alien spacecraft and that the propulsion of the vehicle ran on an antimatter reactor. And it was fueled by the chemical element with atomic number 115, which, again, he says in the documentary, talks about element 115, which at the time was named ununobtainium and had not yet been artificially created. Uh, It was first synthesized in 2003 and later named Moscovium. Moscow. Russians. Oh, no. Oh. And now it's (laughs) an element on the periodic table. You know, he said for years about Element 115, he was talking about it, he was saying stuff about it, and then come 2003, it's added to the periodic table. I think it was like 1983 that he was working there, so 30 years later. Mm. Just another drop in the bucket of validity. Lazar also claims to have read U.S. government briefing documents that described alien involvement and human affairs over the past 10,000 years with beings from the Zeta Reticuli star system. (laughs) There goes Zeta Reticuli again. Yeah, there we go again with the Zeta Reticuli. Lazar's story has been analyzed and rejected by skeptics and some ufologists. Universities from which he claims to hold degrees show no record of him, and supposed former workplaces have no records of him being there after claiming to have earned a master's degree in physics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a master's degree in electronic technology from the California Institute of Technology. They talk about his no employment and no records of his schooling and that's that's a big thing if you're the u.s government and somebody works for you and they blab yeah you're gonna erase them right what is a burn notice or something like that (laughs) i think so yeah because his employment was a physicist at los alamos national laboratory which that's that's huge isn't that like dod funded too isn't that part of the government as well so he worked for a federal or so facility that did that and they no he didn't work here and and places like mit and caltech to be like nah didn't work here the cia and the federal government being involved in top secret ultra top secret majestic level secrecy him coming out and even dropping just a pin drop of some of the stuff that he may or may not have seen in s4 or area 51 it's not beyond reason to think that hey he he opened his mouth we got to do some damage control and they probably scrubbed his whole fucking background his whole life he also claims that he's been attacked somebody shot at his car and tried to yeah, kill him yeah. and all the same traits of the united states federal government so i mean it, it is what it is I was asking myself in my head, why would they erase history of his master's degrees? There's no other reason than to completely destroy his validity, yeah, right? Like, why would you listen him. to this guy who Absolutely. doesn't have a master's Absolutely. in physics yeah. or doesn't have a master's in any sort of technology? You know what kind of fucks up his validity a little bit, too? It's not really his validity on the subject, but what kind of 
hinders him a little bit. In, in 1990, he was convicted for his involvement in a prostitution ring. And then again in 2006 for selling illegal chemicals to people. He's just a guy, man. He's got to make money, you know? He's doing his thing. Yeah, especially when the government's out to get you, destroying your life. Where else do you have to turn except for prostitution rings and <laughs> well, chemicals? I guess 1990, I mean, it might made sense for what he's doing. 2006, though, is a little latter in what's going on. He now owns and operates United Nuclear Scientific Equipment and Supplies, which sells a variety of materials and chemicals, much like he did back in 2006 when they caught him and he no longer has any credit. Don't listen to this man. <laughs> <laughs> Lazar had met and discussed his alleged works on UFOs with Navy pilot and commander David Fravert, who witnessed the USS Nimitz UFO incident in 2004. David Fravor's story is fucking awesome. Which is the Pentagon's leaked footage that they just put out this year, re-leaked. Yes. Yep. That's from his cockpit in his fighter jet off the USS Nimitz, which I, bl I don't think the USS Nimitz is in San Diego, but there's a lot of Nimitz stuff down there. Yeah, I think they, like, filmed it off the coast of San it Diego. It was off the coast of San Diego, yeah. 2004, that was filmed. So we were talking about that was released originally in what, 2015, 16, something like that. Mm. And then it yeah, came, came back out in 2020. Everybody thought it was bullshit. You look at that video, man. 2004, man, the military got some good shit to watch some stuff. So I was talking to somebody about why this information, this video was classified for so long. Like, why, why release it now? And they made a pretty good point. I guess on those FLIR screens, there's a lot of numbers and operating systems, you know, going on around the, the borders of the video that you can see. And they made a pretty good point. Maybe it was classified for so long because some of those numbers would give away certain technology that they had to their jets that maybe they didn't want other countries getting their hands on kind of lose a military advantage but i don't know that might just be a cop out that's entirely yeah, it makes it makes sense it makes a lot of sense the thing about that video is that's crazy you watch the way the craft goes from one one position to another and then tilts and then kind of starts moving i hate to keep referencing this if you've seen the rogan podcast where he's had the interview and i mean this is there, there's a lot of information there so it's a, it's a source but even in the documentary if you listen to him talk about these crafts and the way that they tilt and rotate i think in the documentary he explained economy mode and then sport mode <laughs> this craft yep. does the same exact properties that he claims it does in this so if this is something that they're seeing, whether it be something that these fighter pilots don't even know about that's completely Black Project classified, like hypothetically the, the TR-3B or Black Triangle or whatever, could it be the same type of thing? The most credible witnesses on Earth, man. They're fighter jet pilots. Yeah. Hushlings will return after this short message. Hey, hey, Hushlings. It's Mystery Mike here. We just want to take the time to thank you for supporting our show since the very beginning. It warms our hearts. If you'd like to help us out even more, we'd greatly appreciate it if you would go wherever you stream your podcast and leave us a review, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or Spotify. This helps us not only become a better show, but it also helps us connect with you. For the next two weeks, until December 21st, anyone who goes and leaves a review on our show on any of those platforms will be in a drawing to win an Amazon gift card. It's that simple. Leave your review, let us know, and you're entered. Winner will be drawn 1221. Thanks again, Hushlings. AJ Frund, Alyssa Guernsey, Thomas Valva, Triana Somerville, Noah Tomlin, Arabella Parker. What do these kids have in common? They were fundamentally failed by the very people they trusted with their lives. This is Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane. During each weekly episode, I'll dive deep into a different case of child abuse murder, often including audio clips and conducting interviews with family members or other major players in the cases I cover. Calling attention to these tragic stories can lead to positive changes in the systems designed to protect children. These kids deserve to have their stories told and their voices heard. Subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on your favorite podcast platform. 
Greetings, Hushlings. I'm Slick Frank Sanders. I'm Declassified Dave. And I'm Mystery Mike. Join us on Christmas for a little hush-hush joy as we debut Cryptid Chronicles. We delve into the mysteries of the Jersey Devil with our guest, Jeremy, from Infinite Rabbit Hole Podcast. Happy Holidays, Hushlings. Happy Holidays, Hushlings. Happy Holidays, Hushlings, from all of us at the Hush Hush Society Conspiracy Hour. Welcome back to the Hush Hush Society Conspiracy Hour. Which brings us back down to Earth a little bit. We're going to talk about alien bodies that could be in Area 51. And there's one that's actually got a name. His name is J-Rod. J-Rod? J-Rod, yeah. (laughs) Starting shortstop for the New York Yankees. Yeah, this sounds like a Yankee. (laughs) Dr. Dan Burrish, a microbiologist who worked for the Defense Intelligence Agency, stated that he worked at Area 51 Groom Lake, the runway section of the base. He had also said that he encountered at Area 51 J-Rod, an alien from the Zeta Reticuli star system who crashed in Kingman, Arizona. I wonder if he decided to pick Kingman as the place, or he just was just like, ah, smash. Mm. Ah... (laughs) <laughs> I, I was picturing an alien crashing in my in my imagination. I was thinking to myself, do they scream when they're going down? <laughs> or do they just kind of calmly, mellowy? No no reaction whatsoever. <laughs> do they have feelings? Or, or does it vary? See, like the right. pilot is going down and just makes no face, no sound. But his co-pilot <laughs> is just like, ah! <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Dan claimed the government had him take tissue samples from the captured alien. J-Rod and Birch became friends over the course of two years while Dan was working on the project. J-Rod communicated with Dan through something called, quote, shared consciousness, telling him many stories about J-Rod's civilization and past. J-Rod related that his race inhabited Earth thousands of years ago, but they were forced to leave due to global natural catastrophes. Sounds familiar. (laughs) He alleges that the, quote, Greys wanted to return to Earth to establish relations with humans and recover some genetic variants through human DNA. Isn't that shared consciousness, doesn't that sort of come up with Betty and Barney Hill's story? Like, kind of talking telepathically? Yeah, Betty had said that one of the aliens or one of the extraterrestrials was communicating with her but not opening his mouth, so just talking into her mind. That's pretty generic for, I guess, a gray description as well. But then again, the whole Betty and Barney Hill is the inception of that generic UFO story. True. So, yeah. and and it always draws back. Are we just referencing things that we've seen in pop culture or in past stories that we've heard? Or are these things real? Do they hold any kind of weight? Maybe these grays really do look the way that they're described and maybe they really do come from zeta reticuli and maybe they really do communicate non-verbally the thing that throws the wrench in the works is that they've never found any exoplanets in the zeta reticuli system if they pointed telescopes at it so unless our technology is not that good i mean we could see exoplanets pretty far so if zeta reticuli is in the sense of being local ish why are there no exoplanets if these beings keep saying they're from Zeta Reticuli? It's really weird. And this has come up so many times. I mean, Zeta Reticuli comes up in almost every alien lore. Yeah, yeah. Maybe the planets are cloaked like the runway. Ooh, yeah, but that's, that's mm-hmm. humans. That's assuming that they also found a planet within that system to live on. It's true. They might not be from originally the Zeta Reticuli. That brings up the story of J-Rod. If J-Rod, this alien being, is saying, hey, we used to live here, and then we had to leave, maybe they never found another suitable planet, or maybe they found some other celestial body to take residence in, in that system. Mm. It might be a situation where they found a moon and set up some sort of base or something. Our yeah. moon. I was thinking even a massive asteroid or some yeah. shit. Yeah, it could, it could be anything. Just because we tend to, as humans, look at everything very meticulously from the viewpoint of a human. So to us, we look at it as, well, if we were to make a mass exodus of Earth, we would look for another another suitable planet for us to live on. Maybe that wasn't the mindset. Maybe there was always this plan to come back to Earth where quote-unquote home is. 
and be a part of it again. Maybe they didn't want to stay in that system, but for some odd reason, that's where they ended up, or who knows? There is the whole theory that greys are super evolved humans from the future. Which is yeah. which is also very possible. It, it, I've, yeah. I've actually, I've held that belief for a very long time. If you really look at the structure of a gray, so their heads are a little bigger, which suggests, if you're, if you're looking at it from a human perspective, higher their heads are a little capacity. bigger, higher brain capacity, more advanced uh, thinking. And then you look at huge black pupils. Now, if there was some sort of nuclear holocaust on the planet Earth, it would be dark. Most likely what would happen is it would not only be dark, but we would go underground. Going underground through millennia and, and so many different generations, eventually your bodies start to change. Your eyes would become all pupil because our pupils get bigger to take in more light. So that's why when your pupils get big in the dark to try and absorb more light so that you can see. An alien eye being all black would just be pure pupil. That's a great point. I've never taken that into consideration. But then you also look at something like the nasal cavity. If you look at their nasal cavities, they're just small slits. So if you're going underground or you're in some sort of nuclear wasteland, your body, again, would eventually evolve and your nose would no longer be needed. Your nose primarily is for smelling but it's also for filtration of debris smaller hole less fil or more filtration more filtration and you're not taking in as much oxygen if you really look at the anatomy of grays even even their skin tone look at the gray skin tone you have no vitamin d no hair no melanin no hair no nothing yeah. you don't require that as an underground dweller so you become pale but what about like the pure lack of body mass and being real? Well, short? that's the that's the thing that it, it comes down With to small another caves. Thing. It comes well. <laughs> it comes down to another thing. If you're in caves, I mean, remember, human beings have evolved from smaller to larger, to smaller to smaller. It, it, there's an ebb and flow to the size of our species. But if you were to take our species and put it one million years underground, and like Mike said, you're gonna not need the physiological strength that you have like human beings have with muscle mass you're not going to need the eyesight other than the fact that your pupils are the only thing that you need because of taking in light slits of your mouth and nose maybe taste and smell is a completely different concept and then on top mm -hmm. of it aesthetically everybody looks the same so it's about reproduction and it is now but it's about human beings being a human being and human beings especially have an attractive quality that they deem is attractive. So there is a whole different, and it's not so much smells, it's visual. So if that visual goes away and it's darkness, then why do you need to see somebody who's pretty at this point, just to keep your species alive? That could also be a huge reasoning for abductions. It's been said by many different whistleblowers, it's been said by many different ufologists, that we get abducted by the greys and we're tested on. So maybe they're looking at it as we're taking DNA samples to figure out how we can get back to being human. You, mm, or human-esque. How can we get back our dapper flesh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, our hair and our eyebrows and not looking like giant fish. Maybe, you know. maybe they're looking for that DNA and they're looking for the one key factor that is going to allow them to reintroduce that DNA strand to their own and bring them back to form. But then again, if they have the technology to get back here, why don't they have that? Could be a flawed species. Like, we are. Maybe they're advanced in different ways. You know, we're well, attributing... Yeah, we're attributing things to them just because that's what we do. We want to think of them as a more advanced species. Well, they have space travel and they have this and they have that. Yeah, but maybe that's what they focused on. They focused on that because they had to leave Earth. While we focused on eyebrows and our Exactly. Hair. So they put aside the whole, well, how can we do plastic surgery? How can we extend our lives? <laughs> how can we how can we find better devices to watch fucking reality TV on? They said, Okay, well, the the earth is dying, our planet is dying, it's big deal. We have to put all our focus into this. And it was propulsion. It was travel. It was ships to get away. 
Do you think Elon Musk is a great alien disguise? If anything, that dude's a fucking reptile, bro. <laughs> oh, dude, yeah, but that dude, that dude's the only dude trying to get us the fuck off this planet. Elon could be a Pleiadian. Ooh, he's not blonde mm. enough. That's again. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I truly believe that. And it's, it's been said in a lot of quote-unquote dark web alien videos, alien interview videos, stuff like that. But it is like, we used to be you. We used to be here. We used to live a life like yours until this tragedy hit, until this crisis hit. Or it entirely could be an entirely different species that's from another star system. I mean, it could be, yeah. I think it's more fun in my personal sense. I think it's more fun to think that that's us from the future. It does kind of create a sense of comfort because you're like, oh, well, if that's an evolved human being, I can deal with it better. So maybe that's just the human consciousness switching itself to accept the fact that that might be something real when instead it's something from might actually be from the Zeta Reticuli star system and they don't live on a planet. They live on an asteroid that lives like Frankie said, you know, they live on an asteroid somewhere else. I don't know if I could find comfort in that. I can't find comfort in that, but you can find comfort in the fact that it might be an evolved species of human being. No, no, the the fact that it might be an evolved species really? of human being. Yeah, only because what if there's this, like, you know, little glimmer of vengeance in them? Like, why do they get to fucking live on Earth and we don't? Well, look the at universe us. kicked us out of our planet, but look at them. We look kicked them. ourselves They're destroying out of our fucking it again. planet, if anything. Mm. That, like, uh, if, if they did want to come back and kind of intertwine themselves with earth again they've been observing for god knows how long they're just watching humans destroy the planet yet again wouldn't you think they'd be a little bit salty absolutely but if this guy j-rod that we're talking about is working with dan burrish then he's obviously not a salty one he's trying to educate the human race at some point yeah in a sense Think about traveling distance. The Zeta Reticuli system is 39 and some change light years away. So it takes... That's a long fucking... Yeah, so it takes roughly, at our current technology, it takes roughly 20,000 years to travel a light year. Wow. So if you multiply that by 39 That's, that's and conventional some, rockets. Yeah, that's conventional rockets. So if you multiply that by 39 light years away or that is something that it is, it's like 750,000 years. Now think of a two-way trip. There and back is going to take. We're in the millions. It's not that far off to believe if you look back 750,000 years. Look at some of the things that they're finding. I was just reading about the London Hammer. Have you ever heard of the London Hammer? I have not. So the London Hammer is is an iron hammer with a wooden handle. It looks just like a fucking blacksmith hammer. It is okay. buried in a piece of limestone. So they're they're dating this London Hammer at a million years old. It's inside of the stone. The stone formed around this hammer. Wow. And we've talked about Graham Hancock and, and Randall Carlson and how the human history is a lot longer than archaeologists have been telling us. We've been around a lot longer than we've been led to believe. If you're going to believe anybody in all this skepticism, Graham Hancock is the guy to read his books and really flash your brain on history. You got to think about that traveling distance. You got to think about the time. It's very possible that they could have been us and they could have left. And now they're coming back within the past century or so. They're making their way back and becoming more prevalent because they've been talked about for thousands of years as it is. But especially within the past hundred years or so, they're really showing themselves. Yep. Well, with our current technology being able to record it faster, there's no difference, though, from a UFO sighting, what you can do with your cell phone than what might have been put in a Renaissance painting with a UFO in it. It's a visual representation of what somebody saw. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Birch's story becomes even less credible as he ends his tale by claiming to have saved J-Rod by taking him to Abydos in Egypt and sending J-Rod through a natural star portal. Okay, now we got some sci-fi channel Stargate shit, but <laughs> see, now, when you say something like that, I mean, if you're talking about the pyramids and Egypt, guess you can kind of believe it, because when you're talking about talking to an alien, but then you go about saving them, why? 
I think this is interesting because it literally mirrors Stan Smith's origin story with Roger from American Dad. He like saves <laughs> Roger from Area 51 and, and brings him to his house to be part of the family. I bet you Seth MacFarlane and his writers probably wrote that off of this. I mean, that dude's That'd a smart cool. man. I just want to touch on Abydos real quick. Abydos is well known for, and this is going to sound pretty crazy, it's known for the Temple of Seti. S-E-T-I. I know that SETI is obviously something completely different, and it, it's an acronym and what whatnot for searching extraterrestrial intelligence, but that's kind of a weird little parallel there, that it's known for the Temple of yeah. SETI. Just, yeah. just a little interesting, I didn't know that. interesting tidbit for Thank you for that. Anytime. That was mysterious, Mike. Uh, the Temple of SETI it. also has inscriptions of modern vehicles on it, like helicopters and planes. Is that the one that they show on Ancient Aliens? David Childress. The one that they show... <laughs> <laughs> is that the one that they show on Ancient Aliens where you see like an Apache helicopter that was engraved off or something like yeah, that? Yeah, like. A jet. Yep. It shows a. It shows. Mm-hmm. It shows a jet. It shows some sort of. Uh, it kind of looks like a like a yacht, <laughs> like a yacht speedboat, and it shows old school helicopters from from Vietnam. Or the was Huey's, that Epstein's the, uh, yacht from Ibiza? The Huey helicopters. That was, that's yeah. that's what it what it looks like. Yeah, it's very yeah. interesting. Very interesting for him to say. I took him to to Abydos. A little little weird. Raises little weird. some eyebrows. But it also brings us to the fact that at Area Fifty One. Could it be completely just human beings engineering wild shit? Then again, with Bob Lazar's claims, it's probably reverse engineering more than anything. With this past summer's claims, we have otherworldly spacecraft, which brings us real quick to the TR-3B, which I've explained that I've personally seen in the Declassified Discussions episode number one. If you haven't listened to it, YouTube, (laughs) subscribe. Hush Hush Society Conspiracy Hour. (laughs) But according to Popular Mechanics, there's a military aircraft that may be responsible for a number of the Black Triangle UFOs. And the TR-3A Black Mantra is the name of an actual surveillance aircraft for the U.S. Air Force. TR-3B is a whole nother thing, but maybe that's another model of it. And it could have been something that I've seen in Connecticut twice. It's reportedly seen over Antelope Valley in desert regions of Southern California. So if it's a subsonic vehicle, if you're in Southern Nevada, the Southern California, that's... Yeah. And that stretch of desert Mm. in the Antelope Valley, it draws people interested in, in potential quote unquote black project aircraft because it's so close to several well known military research and testing areas. That could account for a lot of those sightings too. And I'm sure it does. Bob Lazar also claimed that he knew when they were going to test off these flying saucers or experimental spacecraft, per se. There's a lot of other experimental aircraft. We talked briefly about a a few of them within our Majestic 12 Roswell incident episode. Just to look at them again, the Oxcart program, which is a Lockheed A-12, similar to the SR-71. There's Project Aquatone, which is a Lockheed U-2. You also have D-21 Tag Board, which is the Lockheed D-21. And the Lockheed Have Blue, as well as the Lockheed F-117 Nighthawk. That's a more familiar one. I mean, the SR-71 and U-2 is vastly familiar. Yeah. But the 117 Nighthawk is definitely something that people see. That's also kind of like a black triangled shaped jet, right? Well, they're stealth. I think the F-117 Nighthawk is yeah is triangular. Yeah, that's not what I saw because that's an air that's an aircraft. That's not something that hovers like a helicopter, completely silent, and moves erratically. Yeah. That's a completely different thing. Speaking of crazy and going kind of out there, does anybody remember the Facebook event, the Storm Area 51? Who could forget? Absolutely. Yeah, who could re- who could forget it? Did you respond to it? Yeah. You did? Were yeah, you I going? Said I was going. Hell yeah. 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 I was on my way. Yeah. We're probably all on some list now. Yeah, yeah definitely. probably. <laughs> definitely. I mean, we're on I'm on a mer- many medical marijuana recommendations, so I'm I'm on a list. But if you remember the Facebook <laughs> Storm Area 51, I think I responded as I was going to go, but you're fucking crazy if you're going to actually storm it. And it was commonly referred to as the Raid Area 51, Storm Area 51, or the Area 51 Raid. And it took place on September 20th last year. 
The event was created by Maddie Roberts on June 27th, 2019. The event would involve raiding the site in a search for extraterrestrial life that conspiracy lore claims may be concealed inside. So insane. <laughs> there were more than two million people that responded, quote unquote, going, and another million and a half interested on the event's page. Only 150 people showed to the event. Okay, so here's my deal with that, right? <laughs> Even a half. Okay, fuck it. Even a quarter of those people that said that they were going to go. I think they would have made it inside. I don't think they would have seen anything that they were really trying to hide, but I think they would have at least made it inside and it wouldn't have been a fucking stupid rave outside in the desert with guns being pointed at people. That brings to the point how much of Area 51 is on the surface. Not a no, lot. Not I no, probably it. probably like ten percent is on the surface. Probably none of it. I mean, there's probably, baseball fields. Probably even less than that. Yeah. Yeah. There's like a couple hangars, a runway. If you look at a lot of the testimonies from airline pilots, not necessarily over Area 51, obviously, but other areas, they said that they have seen underground bases where the ground opens up like a zipper and you see these planes rising up on these platforms and stuff like that. So if that is technology that exists, which I'm sure that it is, much like, uh, you know, the X-Men Xavier school where the jet comes out of the ground, if that's something that they have, then I'm sure that's obviously what they utilize around Area Area 51. It's something as simple as the Batcave concept, man. Personally, what I think is going on at Area 51 is I want to side with Bob Lazar. I think Bob Lazar is probably telling the truth, and that's probably what they're doing. And they just openly admitted that they have otherworldly spacecraft. If that's yeah. not if that's not enough validation for you, then you're sipping the wrong water. You know, that's all I can say is unless it's a ploy that the US government's doing, there's enough going on right now. As we all know, I think disclosing the fact that they have otherworldly spacecraft probably being reverse engineered at Area 51 since the 80s, 70s, maybe even the 60s. Who knows? Bob Lazar was probably a part of a project of thousands and thousands of people that yeah. have worked on these things. There's probably some crazy shit going on north of Las Vegas and in other places in the United States. And we're going to get to a few of them. Definitely whether it's this season or next season. I personally think that J-Rod might not be real. J-Rod might not be real. But the real. nine extra extraterrestrial spacecraft that they have, after openly admitting that they have something from not of Earth, is probably real. And they probably got some things going on, and it's shit that most people probably can't comprehend as legitimate. If you're listening to this right now, and you're already where our heads are at, it's not that hard to... It's, it's, it's crazy, but it's not that hard to comprehend. Yeah. Over the past 50 years, it used to be where you had to do some sort of mental gymnastics to get to the place where aliens exist, their technology ex exists, the United States has them, and all this other stuff. But now, not only is it confirmed, but you have to look at some of the things that they've slowly been releasing. 2020, for as much of a shit show as it is, has become the year of disclosure. Absolutely. It's become the year of conspiracy. If you really pay attention to the news that's let go, the Pentagon saying that they have otherworldly vehicles and otherworldly technology, non-human technology. Then as far as a couple weeks ago, we have an Israeli former space official saying that aliens exist. He was part of the Israeli space program for over 20 years. And then just most recently, just the other day, they start talking about how sh astronomers found uh, cosmic, quote, superhighways for fast travel through the solar system. There have been pictures taken on Mars of questionable things, of unnatural formations on that planet. There's so much to unwrap. And now with all these disclosures and all these things coming out, you don't have to do mental gymnastics. You don't have to go leaps and bounds to start suggesting that these things are real. Now it's all very plausible and it's all there. It's in your face. If you're ignoring the fact that the that the US government has essentially said there are fucking aliens, we have their technology, we've been in contact with them, if that is not in your mind somewhere every fucking day, then I don't know why you're listening to our show. <laughs> that's th that's one of the craziest things to me is that You've got all these things being disclosed, and they're pretty much presenting it to the masses on a silver platter. And there's still people, there's still people that refuse to look at it. 
They refuse to look at the solid evidence. Could they it's be lying? It's fucking crazy to could me. Could they be lying they to you? They could be. Yes, but why? What's the purpose in telling somebody that we have vehicles of off-Earth origin and not thinking that that's going to cause some fucking mass panic? And the fact that they did it in the midst of the, since the fucking Spanish flu, the worst pandemic that's ever hit, even with the technology that we have to be connected with each other, for us to talk to you guys for that technology, we missed it. Some of us, not all of us. Yeah. The only reason I could imagine that they would lie about something like that is to prep humanity for a potential fake invasion. And I'm not saying that's how it's going to go. I'd like to believe that it's all actually real, but there there is the possibility that, fuck, maybe, maybe they're just getting people mentally prepared for a fake invasion. And I'm not saying aliens running around with laser guns disintegrating people, but a mass event of aliens coming to the planet. It's easing into it, so I guess people like us, and hopefully we can spark some interest in some of our listeners, it's a terrifying aspect that there's something else. But it's something we've been yearning to find for so long. Mm -hmm. If that's the case and it's proven, then let's move on as a species and find some better way to do what we're doing right now. Because right now, 2020 is the most fucked up year I've seen in my life. Yeah. 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 It's definitely a year we're going to tell the grandkids about, that's for sure. Yeah, you guys want to complain about all your stuff? Yeah, well... Oh, your floating car isn't working? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, Let me you... tell you about a whole year where I wiped my ass <laughs> with old t-shirts. Yeah. You... <laughs> <laughs> the premise behind all this Area 51 mythology comes down to the government probably won't reveal what's going on, other than just the, the dick ticklers that they give us, the feelers that they give us. But it's only a, a certain percentage that are going to pay attention to that. So there's obviously something ultra, super, amazingly secret about the whole thing. There's got to be something that they're not going to tell us. Ultimately, in my opinion, Area 51, there's a ton of shit going on there. There's a ton of shit you're never going to know about unless you raid it. Go ahead. Enjoy it. Let us um, know how it goes. Please yeah, live Matt, stream it. Maddie Roberts, Let's please. Stream I would love shit. to have you on our show, Maddie Roberts, if you hear this. Round two. Yeah, I would love to talk to you about your logic of how June 27th, 2019, <laughs> you came up with the thing in your brain <laughs> that you are going to raid Area 51 where there are signs where you'll get shot on sight walking onto it. They, so They can't stop all of us. Yeah, they can't stop all, all 150 of us. I think we can all be appreciative of the Pentagon and the powers to be to throw out that video that we got a couple months ago and say that it was real. And if it's not, we're all fucking idiots. But I think the three of us are, are probably on the same playing field with this. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd say so, yeah. This, this is actually one of those ones that we actually kind of are all on the same page and like this is, this is some real shit. Yet, Area 51 is only one of many military bases, national laboratories, and government scientific research centers across the country that are classified, top secret, and where employees need security clearances. Well, that does it for our Area 51 S4 episode. Make sure to reach out to us. Let us know what you think. Do you think that Area 51 is a hotbed for alien technology and secret government projects? Or could it just be a farce? Is there anything that we missed in our research? Tell us about it. Tell us your thoughts, your opinions. Show us some of your research. You can reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Make sure to email us if you would like to talk to us or go on our Facebook group, Hush Hush Society Conspiracy, our group. You can email us at hush hush society at planetmail.com and reach us there. Hushlings, if you are listening to this debriefing early enough, we'd like to remind you that our Amazon gift card giveaway is coming to an end. Leave a review on our podcast. You will be entered for a chance to win the Amazon gift card. The giveaway ends today, December 21st. Make sure you tune into Debriefing 14 next time for our rundown on Bohemian Grove. We're going to get into some dark, spooky chanting. The debriefing will be released on January 4th, 2021. Our first debriefing of 2021. Hell Let's get yeah. the fuck out of this. Yeah, it's going yeah. to be the same. It's ah. <laughs> Speaking of 2021, 
Don't forget to tune in to our scheduled live show, our second live show. It's going to be super mm. exciting. I Hell believe, yeah. I believe not to throw a red herring in, but I believe our third live show is on our year anniversary, which would be, uh, we've got a lot of things probably planned for that, but probably yeah. go big or <laughs> <Yeah>. go home. <laughs> our live show is on March 29th, where it will be debriefing 20, as well as we will feature a secret society. I am Declassified Dave. And I'm Mystery Mike. And I'm Slick Frank Sanders. And we'll see you next year on the Hush Hush Society Conspiracy Hour. Hushlings, we want to wish you a very happy holidays, since we won't be talking to you through the new year until the 4th. We just want to say thank you for all of your support as always, and we hope that you and your loved ones are safe wearing masks and giving each other six-foot hugs. Happy holidays, Hushlings, whether it be Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Christmas, whatever you're out there celebrating. We appreciate you guys. Thank you. Until our next debriefing, remember, the best-kept secrets are hidden in plain sight.